Imagine this. The most powerful city in the ancient world, Rome, was on the brink of chaos. The streets that once echoed with the footsteps of a great leader, Julius Caesar, were now filled with whispers of betrayal, fear, and uncertainty. The man who had been hailed as a god was now just a memory, his body lying cold in the forum, the heart of Rome. The people who had once cheered for Caesar now found themselves in a strange, uneasy silence, unsure of what the future held. This was the scene that greeted a young, ambitious teenager named Octavian as he stepped into the city that April day in 44 BC. But Octavian wasn't just any teenager. He was Caesar's chosen heir, and his arrival would set in motion a series of events that would change the course of history. Cleopatra, the queen of Egypt, found herself in a similar position of uncertainty. She had been Caesar's lover and ally, and now with his death, she was left to navigate a complex web of political intrigue and shifting alliances. The stakes were high, and the consequences of a misstep could be fatal. Cleopatra, known for her intelligence and charm, had to use every ounce of her wit to stay ahead of the game. Her survival depended on it. As Octavian made his way to Rome, he was greeted by a crowd that grew larger with each passing day. People flocked to him, drawn by the promise of what he represented, the legacy of Caesar. Some saw in him a chance for revenge against those who had betrayed their beloved leader. Others saw a new leader, a fresh face in a city that was tired of the old guard. Octavian, for his part, was cautious. He knew that the road ahead was fraught with danger, and that he had much to learn about the politics of Rome. When he finally arrived in the city, Octavian's first move was to go to the Forum and accept Caesar's adoption. This was a bold statement, a declaration that he was Caesar's true heir. He then made his way to Mark Antony's estate, determined to confront the man who had been Caesar's right-hand man. The meeting was tense, to say the least. Antony, who was more than twice Octavian's age and had a wealth of experience, was not about to yield to a young upstart. The conversation was heated, with both men laying claim to Caesar's legacy. Antony, who had liquidated much of Caesar's estate, was reluctant to hand over the gold that Octavian was demanding. He reminded the young man that political power in Rome was not hereditary, and that Caesar's adoption of Octavian did not automatically grant him the right to lead. Octavian, however, was undeterred. He was determined to avenge Caesar's death and claim his rightful place as the leader of Rome. Meanwhile, Cleopatra was facing her own challenges. She had set out with her fleet to join Antony and Octavian, only to be thwarted by a violent storm that damaged her ships and left her ill. This setback was a blow to her plans, but she was not one to give up easily. She returned to Alexandria, regrouped, and began to plot her next move. She knew that she needed to secure the support of the Caesarians if she was to have any hope of maintaining her power. As the political landscape in Rome continued to shift, Cleopatra found herself in a precarious position. She had to tread carefully, making sure not to alienate anyone who could potentially be an ally. When an emissary named Quintus Delius arrived in Alexandria, Cleopatra knew that this was her chance to turn the tide in her favor. Delius, a man known for his quicksilver loyalties, was tasked with questioning Cleopatra about her allegiances. But when he met her, he was immediately charmed. Cleopatra's beauty, wit, and charm were legendary, and she knew exactly how to use them to her advantage. Delius, recognizing that Cleopatra was not the submissive queen he had expected, advised her to play the part of a goddess. He suggested that she dress in her finest robes, anoint herself with fragrant oils, and present herself to Mark Antony in a way that would capture his attention. Cleopatra, always the master of strategy, took his advice to heart. Three years earlier, Octavian had faced a similar challenge. As he navigated the treacherous waters of Roman politics, he had to outmaneuver powerful figures like Antony and Cicero. Cicero, a brilliant orator and a key player in Roman politics, was initially dismissive of Octavian. He saw him as a mere schoolboy, lacking the experience and gravitas needed to lead. But Octavian proved to be more resourceful than anyone had anticipated. He was able to win the support of Caesar's veterans and the Roman people, gradually building his power base. In the end, it was Octavian's ability to adapt and outsmart his opponents that set him apart. He was patient, strategic, and unafraid to take calculated risks. When he finally confronted Antony, 
he did so with the confidence of a man who knew he had the support of the people. The two men would go on to form an uneasy alliance, known as the Second Triumvirate, along with Marcus Aemilius Lepidus. This alliance would eventually lead to the defeat of Caesar's assassins, but it would also set the stage for a new power struggle that would determine the fate of the Roman Republic. For Cleopatra, the arrival of Octavian and Antony in Egypt would be a turning point. She had long been a player in the Roman political game, using her intelligence and charm to secure her position. Now, with the arrival of these two powerful men, she would have to use all her skills to navigate the new landscape. Her relationship with Antony would become one of the most famous love stories in history, but it would also be her undoing. In the end, Cleopatra's fate would be intertwined with the fate of Rome itself, and the choices she made would have far-reaching consequences. The story of Octavian, Antony, and Cleopatra is a tale of ambition, betrayal, and the struggle for power. It is a reminder that in the world of politics, nothing is ever certain, and that those who are able to adapt and outmaneuver their opponents are the ones who ultimately succeed. As the dust settled on the Roman Republic, a new era was beginning, one that would be shaped by the actions of these three remarkable figures.